Hello and welcome to another weekly update. Well, last week I said things were going to start ramping up and getting busier and this week definitely didn't disappoint. Um, lots and lots of things to talk through. Um, some big news as well uh, for, for developers for Microsoft Teams and Graph as well. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so the first thing uh, you should really be aware of if you do anything with the Microsoft Graph reporting API or um, you use any of the data from the Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Teams admin reports, new changes have rolled out in the past week to automatically anonymize user data by default. Okay, so I've got a video, I've got a blog post going into the details of what what has happened, what the data look used to look like and what it looks like now, which API calls are affected, uh, what in the admin center is affected and also what you can do about it. There is a, you can turn this feature off in the admin center. It's across the whole tenant though and it is on by default. So this will impact you if you have applications that you've written that take like the UPN and do anything with it um, and, you know, um, cross-reference it with anything or, or look it up in some way. So definitely one to be aware of. You can go and check the blog post for all the details. There is a video I've done as well because it's kind of a big deal. Here's the before and after. Here's what it looks like in the admin center. There's loads and loads of information. Here's how to turn it off. Um, so go and check that out if um, if that sounds like a thing that is going to impact you. If you, if you do anything like looking at those reports APIs to get anything and doing anything with the users, um, looking for specific values, all of that stuff, the, the user UPN and the username and anything identifying users or groups or sites has all been turned into like just nonsensical characters. So um, you can't identify users from it anymore. So that's a big one um, and will have impact developers. And so there's work to be done there. So um, that's the first thing. Go check that out, understand what's changed. And then if you need to make changes, you can go and make changes or go and find your admins and try and get them to turn it off for a bit so you can respond. All right, next up, um, another big one actually uh, around charging for Microsoft Teams applications. So the ability for developers to attach a charge to an app in the Teams App Store. This is something that's been we've been talking about for quite a long time. Uh, I did a blog post about it. You can do this so you can see it. Um, so the yeah, first announced at Build 2019 actually, and then um, a year later at Ignite we saw some demos of the work being done in the Teams Admin Center to allow, give admins some visibility over which apps were chargeable, also enable them to buy packs of licenses for users in bulk and, and different subscription plans and stuff. Um, there's a YouTube video I've put a link to as well, so you can go and watch that session still from Ignite. Um, but the big news is that there's a new roadmap item now to to bring this feature into Teams, which feels like kind of the last piece of the puzzle is um, you know, enhancing the Teams admin, the, the app store inside Teams so that when those applications show up, rather than just being free and you download them, there's a kind of gate you go through where you have to purchase them. Uh, or maybe if your admin has purchased it on your behalf or a, a number of licenses on your behalf, you kind of jump through something and something gets counted somewhere. So um, that is set, you can see by the screenshot, actually, it's in the roadmap and it's set as in development with a release date of October 2021. Now, in my experience, I'm going to go ahead and say nothing comes out in October. It comes in the Ignite November. So this feels like something that is going to get announced at Ignite, but I might be wrong. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, there's an update to this as well. A big, big thank you to um, Alexis, who uh, figured out that actually there's a value for this in the Teams app manifest now which gives us some indication that it's probably going to be a commercial marketplace offer. Um, so you can go and check that out, go and check out the manifest. Um, yeah, so interesting and exciting. It looks like this is finally coming, um, which is really good news. Uh, we've, Like I say, we've been talking about it for a really long time now. Um, so it's great that it's. it looks like it's finally coming. And I think it'd be really welcomed actually by, um, by developers. It, I think it should lead to more apps in the App Store, in the Teams App Store, more apps and also higher quality apps. Because first thing, there's an awful lot of um, you know daily active users for Microsoft Teams right now. And wouldn't an indie app developer like to get their application in front of all those eyeballs? But also, um, it, I think it's going to lead to bigger and more complicated, more complex, more involved applications as well if... Um, 
developers and development houses know that they can charge for this and they can make their money back. So all, all good. Uh, all right, next up. Um, another thing. Uh, so this is more of a tip than a piece of news. Uh, it's just a, an interesting piece of information I found out over the weekend. It's, um, you know, in... Microsoft Graph, uh, you'll have uh, any number of enums for, for different things. And have you noticed that often these enums have a unknown future value on them? This is what I'm talking about in this blog post. Um, what is that unknown future value and what is it for? So in the blog post, I go into a whole load of detail about what it's, it's actually called a sentinel value um, and what it's for and what it does. But the really interesting bit is you can use it to get told about things that are not like that new things that uh, have been added since the enum was um, made public and gone to v1. Because once the enum goes to v1, uh, adding extra enums is going to break applications. So um, Microsoft don't want to do that, but also they may need to add to enums. And so you may not be getting the full picture if you're just looking at v1 and you're just looking at the enums. And you may not be getting the full picture on the data either um, if those enum values are used in the data. So there is a thing you can do. It's a specific HTTP header um, you can use to uh, say that regardless of what the supported enums are or the published enums, I want to get future um, unknown ones as well. Uh, then you can go and do that. Um, yeah, it's kind of really interesting. Um, I hadn't really sort of thought about this before. I'd never really kind of questioned why that odd kind of unknown future value was there all the time. Um, but uh, this is what it's for. Um, yeah, really interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to find there's a special name for these enums as well uh, that I now can't find. It's like an evolving enum or something. Um, so anyway, interesting. Uh, I don't think you should use it all the time. I think you should use it sparingly um, because actually if you've got code that uh, iterates enums and works with enums, uh, it probably will not be super happy if random new enum values show up. So um, unless you're 100% confident that you, everything you're doing in your code could cope with uh, additional enums, then uh, or additional enum values, then, um, then maybe it will give this a go, but yeah, whatever. So that's kind of interesting um, as well. And there's lots of interesting things this week, right? So, that, you know, I thought that was interesting as well. Um, yeah, just kind of explains some of the, the reasoning behind some of the things you see in Microsoft Graph. And also it's an interesting pattern to use free nums as well um, that you might want to use yourself in your own APIs. And finally... Let's talk about, um, I say finally, I mean, there must be something else as well. Oh, there is. I know what it is. So not quite finally, but this is a, um, a blog post I wanted to call out from the Microsoft Teams developer blog. And this, okay, so Microsoft Bot Framework and writing bots with Teams. If you've ever done anything writing um, bots with a Microsoft Bot Framework, you'll know about the service URL, which is normally uh, smba.trafficmanager.net slash AMER. And in all the documentation, Microsoft say, you um, you need to look this up. You need to get it from the first interaction you have with the Bot Framework, the notification you have about anything, you will get a service URL and you need to store that and use that for any proactive chats out um, and any proactive messaging out. Uh, you need to keep that service URL. Don't just assume that it's going to be smba.trafficmanager.net slash MER. That piece of advice, look it up, don't just assume, is good, but probably also ignored a little bit. I've seen it ignored in Microsoft sample code as well. You can go and find code in GitHub, and, you know, and Microsoft owned GitHub code that assumes that it's slash AMER. And that's because the concrete implementation of this, it always has been slash AMER um, until very recently. What's happened? What's changed? Well, um, recently, just got July just gone, um, Microsoft uh, announced that Microsoft Teams is now included in Microsoft 365 Multi-Geo. What does that mean? It means organizations can control where... Um, the location of their data where specific specific data centers for their data to be stored in that does change the service url and that means that that service url might change between regions so it's now really important that you you do respect the 
the service URL that you're getting back for that particular user and that particular interaction, you use that. You don't try and use one service URL in another place for a different user because users may live in different data centers and their data may live in different data centers and doing that sort of thing now won't work anymore. So this is a really good blog post because it goes into a, a lot of detail, a lot more than I just went into. Um, it tells you exactly what to do. It's a reminder of the you know the best practice you should already be doing, but you might not be. So um yeah this is uh this is worth knowing if you're doing any with anything with like proactive messaging 100 percent you need to be on this so um that's for you take a look at that blog post and uh have a look the only other thing i want to tell you about this week is i did a video um about commsverse because as you know as i keep talking about commsverse is coming up um and i did a look through the session catalog which is kind of um i've not done that before and it was really good fun and it was really interesting uh but i did it as like a live stream so you can go and watch it too um just the process that I go through in choosing sessions. Uh, I did it for day one. I'm going to do it for day two this week coming up. So you can look out for that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing it for the two uh, in-person days. There are a bunch of virtual days as well. I know I've spoken about them before. They are happening. Like we're about halfway through them now. Like, uh, you know, we've had them all this week. We've got more next week as well. Um, so look out for those. Uh, yeah, lots and lots of things going on. Uh, but yeah, go and check out that video uh, if that sounds interesting. If you are um, choosing sessions for Consverse, you know, uh, maybe you look at that as well. I don't know. You probably have your own way of doing it, but that's mine. So you can check it out. Also for Consverse, just be aware um, you you need to have a test. You need to have a negative test result for COVID um, within 48 hours of the conference starting. So bear that in mind. Um, order your test kits if you need them if you're in the uk um and you can get them for free from the nhs uh, if you're coming from overseas i don't know how you get your test kits but you need to have a negative test result within 48 hours um so make sure you've got that it's a condition of entry it's a condition of entry even if you're vaccinated even if you're double vaccinated even if you're speaking it is a condition of entry so don't get it wrong don't end up on the wrong side of the commsverse organizers anyway that's definitely now everything from me um so i'm going to say have a great week and whatever it is you're doing and i will talk to you again next time